Well, welcome everybody. It's nice to be here tonight, isn't it? It's a lovely night. And come and uh, read a bit of the word together and pray together and spend a bit of time together in fellowship. It's a lovely thing. Um, I want to read just a, a little bit from John chapter 7. And folks at home, you're also super welcome as well. And I hope if you want to read along with us, we're looking at John chapter 7. We're going to read in and around verse 46. And this is um, where the Lord is is uh, really uh, causing some commotion amongst the, Philist- uh, the, the Pharisees and the Jews. So much so that actually the Jewish ruling council, the Pharisees, rather send out some of the temple guards to arrest Jesus and to bring him in. Um, uh, in fact... We come in about verse 25 of chapter 7. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man they're trying to kill? Here he is speaking publicly and they are saying, they are not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really considered that he is the Christ? Um, And and then they they go on, they send out temple guards to arrest him. Um, and in verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. And then if the Lord speaks a bit more. And then we'll come down to verse 46 of chapter 7. This is where the temple guards come back. Uh, verse 45, finally the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees. Who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the the guards declared. And it's just that line, that reply of the guards I want to sort of think about tonight. Let's just pray together for a moment. Father, we thank you for your living word, that it is your living word. And we pray as we as we ruminate on it and think about it, meditate upon it, that Lord you will speak to every single one of us and help us to be drawn closer to your word and to the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, words are powerful things, of course, very powerful things. I'm going to say some things, and I wonder if you know who said them. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. (laughs) I think you know who that was, do you? You're right. Yes, you're right. Well done. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. J.F. Kennedy, in his inauguration speech in 1961, the previous one was just after Dunkirk, and uh, it was a real morale boost to the country at the time. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the colour of their skin, but by the content of their character. Martin Luther King, King. again, that was 1963 in Washington with a quarter of a million people there. And it's a marvellous speech, actually, I was listening to it today, today again. I know I have the body of but a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and a, uh, of a king of England too, and think foul scorn that Parma or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm. Elizabeth I. That's right. So there's lots of speeches we could go through, you know, we pick out of history, and some of them are very memorable, and some of them you will remember, you maybe heard them being said at the time, and very stirring uh, speeches at the time, and, and, and speeches sometimes that changed or, or directed history. But, um, and those are excerpts of some of the world's most famous speeches, I suppose. I pulled out for the, what I thought was maybe the top 20 or so. But they were just words of mortal human beings, all the same. They were just people like you and me who maybe were 
in the right place at the right time and the right things to say. But um, what about whenever the Word, the living Word, who is the Word himself, the Logos, walks among us and speaks? Um, and although when the Lord is here, his, obviously his signs and miracles drew people to come and see you, particularly if you were ill or sick or had a child who was sick, of course you'd want to rush to see this man who's making people well. But although those things drew people to Jesus, it seems that it was his words that really enthralled them. And after Jesus told the parable about the wise and foolish builders, and the point of that parable was you know, to point out that whether you listen to his words or whether you don't listen to his words makes you wise or foolish. And it was about listening to his words. And he said this in Matthew chapter 7, 28. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowd were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Now, rabbis, I was looking this up, thinking about how rabbis, and they still do to an extent, um, how they taught and how um, Jesus was so very, very different. Now, we've been brought up in a Christian, Christianized anyway, society, and we're, we're used to hearing the Bible read uh, from our school days right up, and we're, we're sort of used to this in a sense. But this was totally shocking to these people who were brought up in a culture utterly different. The rabbis were always quoting um, authorities other than themselves. They would quote an, another school of thought, uh, another uh, another tradition or or another rabbi who had set in place tradition maybe generations before and these are the things that they would bring up and 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 the uh, the law that they quoted from was called the torah now the torah as you know was the first five books of the bible what we would call the pentateuch moses first five books and and they would quote from this this would be the law that they would use for their daily living and whenever the rabbis were asked for opinions on things these these were the laws that they would go back to, but not just that. There was also, as well as the Torah, those first five books, there was also what was called the Oral Tor Torah. And the Oral Torah were the additions to the Torah, comments, explanations, interpretations that had been added orally. That they weren't written down in the first five books of the Bible, but the rabbis would know all these and pass all these oral Torah traditions around. Um, you know, as Rabbi so-and-so, uh, Ezekiel once said, or they would quote these rabbis, to, to one, and they would become, they would have the same force and authority as the Torah, the oral Torah. And then they had on top of that, uh, that oral Torah became the, what was called the Talmud and the Midrash. But the, the, Mish, the, the Mishnah was another thing again. It was a compilation of legal debates and uh, opinions that rabbis had had over the generations, over hundreds of years, discussing the Torah and the Talmud and the and the and the oral Torah and and all the different viewpoints that they would have about this. Uh, and so, whenever rabbis would speak about something, they would quote, "Well, the school of." You know, the school of uh, Sephora says this, or the school of Eliezer says this, and they would compare and contrast, and it would be a long process of weighing up what other rabbis had said. And if you've ever seen it, it's a very good film, we're talking about the other night, The Fiddler on the Roof. And it's, it's quite funny, but the key character is a, a guy called uh, Tevia, and it's set in Russia during the time of the Tsars. And uh, during the pogroms are starting, the pogroms are starting to happen that persecuted the Jews. And um, so they're in a little Jewish village, and a man is talking about his horse that he bought off this other man. And he said he bought this horse, but it wasn't; it was too old. And this other man said, "No, it wasn't that old." And Tevia comes into the two of these men who are arguing about the age of this horse had been. And Tevia says, "You know, you, you're right, brother. You're right." And the other guy, he gives off, but the horse's teeth, look at his teeth, that's far. He says, you're right, you are right as well. And the third man comes in, he says, hang on, Tevia, they both can't be right. And Tevia pauses for a moment and he weighs these up. And he says, you know, you're also right. <laughs> but that, that nature of that sort of weighing up things and discussing, that's how the rabbis kind of worked. You know, the, and so there were different authorities that were, were quoted and, and, uh, and referred to. 
And, and uh, the Pharisees themselves absolutely prided themselves on knowing all these, the Torah and the Oral Torah and the Talmud and the Mishnah, and knowing all those things, knowing what the previous rabbis had said. So whenever they were asked for something, they would, that's how they would deliver an answer. Uh, and because of that, of course, their answers were sometimes quite vague, sometimes very long, and, uh, and so on. And then the Lord Jesus comes along. He's completely, utterly different. Nothing like that. He doesn't sit and weigh up what rabbis have said before him. Remember, he says, but you have heard it said, but I say unto you. How many times do you read that in scripture? You've heard it said, but I say unto you. And, and this was shocking for the, for the rabbis. And, and in John 7, going back a wee bit, back to verse 15, the Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having studied? Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. They were absolutely astounded that Jesus could stand up and say these things. And of course, the whole debate was, where, where did he get that from? I mean, all the rabbis that we have in our villages, the, the senior, we know what school they've been been to. And there were various different schools, Tiberius, Sephorus, the Babylonian school, the Caesarean school, there's all these different schools of thought. And the rabbis had spent a lifetime studying and studying all these texts so that they have, whenever they were talking about something, they would have had all this background. And, and so these men who had become rabbis had, had rabbis had dedicated all of their lives, and maybe in their 50s or 60s, before they were qualified to comment on things, and the people in the village would go and ask them for advice. But here's a young carpenter. He's in his early 30s. He's, they, and those who knew him knew where he came from, knew he was Joseph's son, knew he was a carpenter. Maybe they even had furniture in the house that he had made. And they were just astounded. Where's he got all this from? As it says in AV, where did he get his letters? Where did he get his, his learning? It was really quite astounding. It shouldn't have been possible that he was able to speak the way he spoke. And so this was quite shocking. And of course the Jewish leaders, their noses were the most put out. And in Matthew chapter 21, as Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching... The chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? You see, you can see how they're thinking. You know, who's, who's, where's the rabbinical school, the rabbinical school you've been to? What, where's your background? Who's your, who's your tutor? Where did you learn? At whose knees did you learn this? By what authority do you have to stand up here and say these things? And who gave you this authority? So it was with that mindset that. They were just totally shocked by this young rabbi, this young carpenter, that they sent out the temple guards to arrest him, to bring him in. Now, those temple guards, if you imagine, they, they must have been in the synagogue and the temple all, all their lives, you know. They have heard debates going on and on and on. They're the temple guards. I mean, they're the guard of the temple. So they stand around a lot, listening to what's going on. It would be like, you know, it would be like uh, one of the guards to... Uh, Westminster or something uh, to the House of Commons who stands at the door and hears the debates going on for years and years. These Kemple guards have heard it all. Heard the way speeches are presented, how they're loaded, how they're argued. And they go to arrest Jesus. And they come back empty handed and they say, but listen, we just couldn't arrest them. We have never in our life experienced anything like what we heard there before. They just, just couldn't arrest them. This wasn't in them. They had never heard anybody speak like that before. And in John chapter 7, verse 37, On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Now, that is absolutely shocking. A rabbi would never, ever say anything like that, direct attention to himself, or say that he had an answer like that, or say that the answer was in him. If anyone is thirsty, Jesus says, let them come to me. So this is, it's hard to grasp for us who are so used to hearing the, the Bible that how shocking this was as Jesus spoke. 
Whoever believes in me, may that just, what? Is he saying believe in him? As the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said, He is the Christ. They, they, there could be no other answer. Who else could speak like that? Here's a question then. Why did Jesus' words astound some people, divide others, and offend yet others? Well, I think part of the answer is found, that, is found in Hebrews chapter 4. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And the Pharisees felt that. They knew at different times whenever Jesus was explaining a, or, or giving a, a parable, they knew that he was speaking about them. That the story of the Good Samaritan was a story about uncovering the way the Pharisees were behaving. And they felt that. They felt, they felt that exposure. And we all should feel that exposure when we come before God's word. And I remember one time years ago, about 30 years ago, whenever we started to train in the fire service, they took us out to a place for our meals on, a, on the weekends in a place in Newton Ards. There was a grubby sort of, I'm not mentioning his name, but it was a grubby sort of a place. And the food was all right, but the place was grubby and it was really subdued lighting. I don't really like subdued lighting. I like to be able to see your faces, you know. And um, it was very, you know, I mean, you, one of those sort of dark sort of restaurant places you can hardly see. And paradoxically, a couple of years later, we had a, there was a fire in that establishment. And uh, we were called up to it along with Newton Arts Station and we fought the fire in the building. And of course, now we had all the lights turned on. Now the fire wasn't too bad, it was, it was quickly subdued. But whenever the lights were on in this place, the place was filthy. It re you know, when all the lights were, now I know why I had the lights so low. Because <laughs> so, so the people coming to it couldn't see the state of the place. It really was, it was run, runs down the walls and everything. Whenever all the lights were, all our big bright lights were put on inside the rooms. And that's like what the word of God does to us, isn't it? You know, it does expose us. And um, nobody, it's hard to read the Bible and be proud, in other words, about, your own, about yourself. Whenever you read how the, the word just exposes who we are and, and it's not fooled. And the Lord wasn't fooled. And when he spoke, he spoke in that nature of, of the words that exposed the deeds of men. So that's why it divided them. That's why it astounded them. That's why it offended them. Because bear in mind, every word that Jesus spoke was scripture. <laughs> whenever the Logos speaks, whenever the word made flesh speaks, every word he speaks is scripture. There's not casual conversation going on there with, with Jesus. Everything he says is scripture. Yeah. And, uh, and, and every word penetrated the, heart, the, the hearts of his listeners. And I don't suppose, I, I'm, this is just me thinking this, but I don't suppose that anybody who was in the presence of Jesus really forgot anything he said. Which is probably why whenever the Gospels all concur, you know, with the words that Jesus said are the same and each of the, the Gospels are extremely close because they all remember those things. Whenever the Word who is, who is the living Word, whenever the Logos himself, the Word of God speaks, it's not just like the speeches we heard in Washington or in, or in Westminster. And whenever Peter, you remember, stood up on the day of Pentecost and he did a lot of quoting from the, the word of God. When the people heard this in Acts 2, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? They were cut to the heart. That's what the word of God does. And we could all tell stories of how maybe we've been going a certain way and just God has just spoken to us. And it's been his word that did it. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure you agree with me on that. And whenever Jesus spoke... His words are absolutely impossible to ignore. Now, mind I like them. 
<laughs> the Pharisees wanted him arrested because of it. Others were amazed at his words, but you couldn't ignore his words. Nobody fell asleep on the green hill with the 5,000 people who were fed with the, the, the fish and bread. Nobody, we don't read of anybody falling asleep there. Isaiah 55 says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. I like the way that there's a contemporary English version that says it, shortens it down to this, to contemporary English. That's how it is with my words. They don't return to me without doing everything I send them to do. Hmm. Some stirring and dramatic speeches have been said in the past in history, but Jesus' words are different, they're eternal, because the Bible tells us that. His words shall last forever. All the words that Jesus said will last forever. You know, some of the great speeches will last a long time, and we'll pass them on to our children, and they'll maybe hear them and, on, on the media, but, but they're, not, they're not eternal. God's words are eternal. I just want to finish with this. Towards the end of his life, Napoleon, the Emperor Napoleon, was in a conversation with one of his great generals. He was called General Bertrand. And Bertrand wasn't a believer by any manner of means. In fact, he was an agnostic. And uh, he couldn't conceive how a mere man, and that's how he conceived of Jesus, as just a, a rabbi, just a, a mere man. He couldn't conceive how his emperor would be in such holy awe of Jesus whom he had dismissed in his mind as just a person from history. And Napoleon responded to General Bertrand with these words that were remembered by the general and put down. He said this, I know men, and I tell you Jesus Christ was not a man. Superficial minds see a resemblance between Christ and the founders of empires and the gods of other religions. That resemblance does not exist. There is between Christianity and other religions the distance of infinity. Alexander, Caesar, Charmagne and myself founded empires. But on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon sheer force. Jesus Christ alone founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men will die for him. He went on to refer to other so-called gods. He dismissed them as false and full of errors and foibles of other leaders and religions in the past. But he said this of Jesus. It is not so with Christ. Everything in him astonishes me. His spirit overawes me and his will confounds me. Between him and whoever else in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. He is truly a being by himself. His ideas and his sentiments, the truths which he announces, his manner of convincing are not explained either by human organization or by the nature of things. I search in vain in history to find a similar to Jesus Christ or anything which can approach the gospel. Neither history, nor humanity, nor the ages, nor nature can offer me anything with which I am able to compare it or explain it. Here, everything is extraordinary. And that was the Emperor Napoleon speaking of the Lord Jesus. And we're so blessed that we do have this word, his, the, the Theon used to us, the breath of God, the living word. Um, so I think we should remember to thank God for it. Because we have several in our homes, you know, in different translations and different states of repair, we can grow a little bit accustomed. And um, we just pray that this word will mould us and reform us and change us in our hearts into the person God wants us to be, because that's the purpose of his word, to get into us and change us. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your living word that it is living. Lord, we thank you for men and women in the past who have made uh, really quite resounding speeches, but nothing compares to the Lord Jesus. And we thank you, Father, that his words are eternal and they have the power to change lives. And millions have been changed when they've been exposed to his words, to your word. So, Father, help us as we pray tonight to appreciate what we hold in our hands and help us Lord to treasure it that we are in Jesus name Amen Okay thanks for listening and thanks for folks at home